Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 506, Apple Season. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello! It is approaching apple season here in the Northeast. We had one day, one glorious, lovely, spectacular day where you could feel it coming And then that just disappeared, and it's been hot and humid. But there is promise somewhere in the future of cooler temperatures, drier air, and apples, which also play an important part in today's chapters. Crafty-wise, that means it's been too hot to do a lot of things that I've been wanting to do, but I've started to be really interested in how certain artists have accomplished what te- what techniques they've used to accomplish some of the things that they've done. And the one that I've been most intrigued by lately is Maxfield Parrish. I put a link to his wiki art page on the show notes, and I have a, a screenshot of one of his more famous prints. Most of us, I think, <laughs> my age-ish, remember the Princess Bride poster? That was inspired by the work of Maxfield Parrish. He was kind of an interesting guy and actually from the Philadelphia area, or he as an adult was in the Philadelphia area. So I was kind of intrigued by that too. But there's, there is something about his use of the color blue. And it, it has made me want to go back and reread Sacre Bleu by Christopher Moore, which as I recall was a fairly vulgar book about the color blue in art like historically. And I just, I just need to go back and check that out again. I put a link to the book and Christopher Moore's website in the show notes. Christopher Moore's website offers you the first couple of chapters to read free, completely free. So if you're interested, you can go and have a look at craftlit.com slash 506. All right our chapters today. Chapters 10 and 11. We're just clipping through this book, right? Because it's designed to be that kind of book. It's sort of a kid's book, but as you'll see as we continue on, it gets a little gray in in some places. And today is the first hint we get of what kind of grayness we might be heading into. So things to know. They're probably going to be on board this ship once they launch for two and a half to three months to get to the island. That's a long time. And they have to carry provisions for everybody for that whole time. The provision carrying thing is kind of cool because they only have 26 men on board, but the ship could hold about 80. So there are fewer people than there might otherwise be. That means they've got a little bit more room to move around and have some privacy. I would lose my mind if I were in this situation. I do not know how these guys do it. I I need my alone time a little bit more than this. Don't forget what a capstan is. The capstan is where is that big knob on the deck where you would insert the pole and push. And if you and several other people were all pushing on your own individual poles that were stuck into this big knob, you would be able to turn the crank that raised the anchor. So you will actually hear them doing that today. There are a couple of professional positions that are mentioned today that are uh, routine to ship life. And this goes all the way from piracy to Royal Navy. Everyone has a position that runs by these names. They 
change a little bit depending on what kind of ship you're on, but the the basic upshot is a bosun or a boatswain, spelled B-O-A-T-S-W-A-I-N, but not usually pronounced that way, is literally the boat servant. Swain is, I think, Norse for servant. So not an officer, but super important. This is the guy who is in charge of the deck equipment. He's part of the the deck staff. He'd be responsible for the equipment and the hull. So kind of all the external parts of the ship would be what he was responsible for. And also running the crew to do upkeep and maintenance on these things. Now that job description changes a bit if you get into the Navy, but that's the upshot. An important person, not some lowly deck swabbing dog. So uh, that's the bosun. Coxswain, C O X S W A I N, is instead of the boat servant, he is the landing vessel servant. That would be the little boats, the rowboats that hung off the side of the ship that would allow you to, say, get to land if you had to moor your ship out further than you could comfortably walk to get to dry land. He is also, on top of being the guy who's responsible for getting in those boats, using those boats, rowing those boats, piloting those boats, and you may have heard this term in sculling before, he, in our case he, is also responsible for navigation and steering. So making sure you're going in the right direction. So this is a guy, again, not an unimportant job. This is a guy who has some education, at least having apprenticed to become a coxswain. He would have been educated in ramp reading and the math that was required to navigate. If you have seen people sculling, there's a person often at the front of the vessel facing all of the scullers, the, the rowers, and calling the, the stroke time, uh, making sure that they are actually going in the direction that they want to go in. And that only happens well if you are all working together. So a coxswain's really an important position. You are going to hear the term barbecue used today. And my jaw kind of hit the floor when I heard that because I thought, wait a minute, barbecue? that can't be an old word. Where did that come from? And of course, the answer is, well, yes, yes, it can be a very old word. It's been around for a while. And not surprisingly, the etymology of it is a bit confused. But what I thought was the most likely when I was reading up on this was that it was probably originally an Arawak word from a tribe in the Caribbean. So not surprisingly, sailors slash pirates would have picked up on it. And of course, that means it would have intermingled and moved with people. So it went back to Spain and that's where it became barbacoa. And both of these terms referred to a rack that you would use to dry or smoke meat. So it would help if that was a metal rack, but you could do it out of wood, which is what they seem to have done early on. And this would have meant uh, dig a pit, build a fire, cook some meat, use this rack to keep the meat away from the flames themselves. Makes sense. Now, of course, if you had access to metal, that made this so much easier because you could just place that thing over an open pit, build your fire in the pit, throw that metal grate or rack down over the pit, and then plunk down an entire animal that you've dressed and split. That sounds so unappetizing when you say it that way. But as we know, the word barbecue has morphed and changed. It no longer just refers to the metal grate. Now it refers also to the food that comes off the grate, because you can have some great barbecue if you are lucky. Barbecue in this case also refers to the person doing the cooking. So keep your ears open for that. Uh, The last term that's going to come up, another position aboard the ship, is quartermaster. And quartermaster is... I save this for last because there seems to be zero agreement over what it actually means specifically. The term is used in lots of different countries for lots of different positions. The one thing that seems consistent is that you have to be pretty high up in the rank to be a quartermaster. So that's the important part there. 
a quartermaster is an important guy. You're going to get some wonderful pirate narrative today of trips and voyages and adventures, and it's, it's just a lot of fun, today's chapters. So here we go as we get underway on board the Hispaniola with Jim Hawkins and his crew. Here we go. Chapter 10, The Voyage. All that night we were in a great bustle getting things stowed in their place and boatfuls of the squire's friends, Mr. Blandley and the like, coming off to wish him a good voyage and a safe return. We never had a night at the Admiral Bembo when I had half the work, and I was dog-tired when, a little before dawn, the boatswain sounded his pipe and the crew began to man the capstan bars. I might have been twice as weary, yet I would not have left the deck. All was so new and interesting to me, the brief commands, the shrill notes of the whistle, the men bustling to their places in the glimmer of the ship's lanterns. "'Now, Barbecue, tip us a stave!' cried one voice. "'The old one!' cried another. "'Oi, oi, mates!' said Long John, who was standing by with his crutch under his arm, and at once broke out in the air and words I knew so well. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest. And then the whole crew bore chorus. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. And at the third ho, drove the bars before them with a will. Even at that exciting moment it carried me back to the old Admiral Bembo in a second, and I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping in the chorus. But soon the anchor was short up, Soon it was hanging, dripping at the bows. Soon the sails began to draw, and the land and shipping to flit by on either side, and before I could lie down to snatch an hour of slumber, the Hispaniola began her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. I am not going to relate the voyage in detail. It was fairly prosperous. The ship proved to be a good ship, and the crew were capable seamen, and the captain thoroughly understood his business. But before we came the length of Treasure Island, two or three things had happened which require to be known. Mr. Arrow, first of all, turned out even worse than the captain had feared. He had no command among the men, and people did what they pleased with him. But that was by no means the worst of it, for after a day or two at sea he began to appear on deck with hazy eye, red cheeks, stuttering tongue, and other marks of drunkenness. Time after time he was ordered below in disgrace. Sometimes he fell and cut himself, sometimes he lay all day long in his little bunk at one side of the companion. Sometimes for a day or two he would be almost sober and attend to his work at least passably. In the meantime we could never make out where he got the drink. That was the ship's mystery. Watch him as we pleased, we could do nothing to solve it, and when we asked him to his face, he would only laugh if he were drunk, and if he were sober, deny solemnly that he ever tasted anything but water. He was not only useless as an officer and a bad influence among the men, but it was plain that at this rate he must soon kill himself outright, so nobody was much surprised nor very sorry when, one dark night, with a head sea, he disappeared entirely and was seen no more. Overboard, said the captain. Well, gentlemen, that saves the trouble of putting him in irons. And there we were without a mate, and it was necessary, of course, to advance one of the men. The boatswain, Job Anderson, was the likeliest man aboard, and though he kept his old title, he served in a way as mate. Mr. Trelawney had followed the sea, and his knowledge made him very useful, for often he took a watch himself in easy weather and the coxswain, Israel Hands, was a careful, wily, old, experienced seaman, who could be trusted at a pinch with almost anything. He was a great confidant of Long John Silver, and so the mention of his name leads me on to speak of our ship's cook, Barbecue, as the men called him. Aboard ship he carried his crutch by a lanyard around his neck, to have both hands as free as possible. It was something to see him wedge the foot of the crutch against a bulkhead, and, propped against it, yielding to every movement of the ship, get on with his cooking like someone safe ashore. 
Still more strange was it to see him in the heaviest of weather cross the deck. He had a line or two rigged up to help him across the widest spaces. Long John's earrings, they were called, and he would hand himself from one place to another, now using the crutch, now trailing it alongside by the lanyard, as quickly as another man could walk. Yet some of the men who had sailed with him before expressed their pity to see him so reduced. "'He's no common man, Barbecue,' said the coxswain to me. "'He had a good schooling in his young days, and can speak like a book when he's so minded, and brave a lion's nothing alongside of Long John. I've seen him grapple four and knock their heads together, him unarmed.' All the crew respected and even obeyed him. He had a way of talking to each, and doing everybody some particular service. To me he was unweariedly kind, and always glad to see me in the galley, which he kept as clean as a new pin, the dishes hanging up burnished, and his parrot in a cage in the corner. "'Come away, young Hawkins,' he would say. "'Come and have a yarn with John. Nobody more welcome than yourself, my son. Sit you down and hear the news. Here's Cap'n Flint. I calls my parrot Cap'n Flint, after the famous buccaneer. Here's Cap'n Flint, predicting success to our voyage. Wasn't you, Cap'n?" And the parrot would say, with great rapidity, "'Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! till you wondered that it was not out of breath, or till John threw his handkerchief over the cage. "'Now that bird,' he would say, "'is maybe two hundred years old, Hawkins. They live forever, mostly, and if anybody see more wickedness, it must be the devil himself. She sailed with England, the great Captain England, the pirate. She's been at Madagascar, and at Malabar, and Suriname, and Providence, and Portobello. She was at the fishing up of the wrecked plate ships. It's there she learned pieces of eight, and little wonder, three hundred and fifty thousand of Americans. She was at the boarding of the Viceroy of the Indies, out of Goa she was. And to look at her, you would think she was a babby. But you smelt powder, didn't you, Cap'n? Stand by to go about, the parrot would scream. Ah, she's handsome craft, she is, the cook would say, and give her sugar from his pocket. And then the bird would peck at the bars and swear straight on, passing belief for wickedness. There, John would add, you can't pitch and not be mucked, lad. Here's the poor old innocent bird of mine, swearing blue fire, and none the wiser you may lay to that. She would swear the same, in a manner of speaking, before the chaplain. And John would touch his forelock with a solemn way he had that made me think he was the best of men. In the meantime the squire and Captain Smollett were still on pretty distant terms with one another. The squire made no bones about the matter. He despised the captain. The captain, on his part, never spoke but when he was spoken to, and then sharp and short and dry, and not a word wasted. He owned, when driven into a corner, that he seemed to have been wrong about the crew, that some of them were as brisk as he wanted to see, and all had behaved fairly well. As for the ship, he had taken a downright fancy to her. "'She'll lie a point nearer the wind than a man has the right to expect of his own married wife, sir. But—' he would add. All I say is, we're not home again, and I don't like the cruise. The squire, at this, would turn away and march up and down the deck, chin in air. A trifle more of that man, he would say, and I should explode. We had some heavy weather, which only proved the qualities of the Hispaniola. Every man on board seemed well content, and he must have been hard to please if they had been otherwise, for it is my belief that there was never a ship's company so spoiled since Noah put to sea. Double grog was going at the least excuse. There was duff on odd days, as, for instance, if the squire heard it was any man's birthday, and all was a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist for any one to help himself that had a fancy. "'Never knew good to come of it yet,' the captain said to Dr. Livesey. "'Spoil forecastle hands, make devils. That's my belief. 
But good did come of the apple-barrel, as you shall hear, for if it had not been for that we should have had no note of warning, and might all have perished by the hand of treachery. This is how it came about. We had run up the trades to get wind of the island we were after. I am not allowed to be more plain, and now we were running down for it with a bright lookout day and night. It was about the last day of our outward voyage, by the last computation. Some time that night, or latest before noon of the morrow, we should sight the treasure island. We were heading south-west, and had a steady breeze abeam and a quiet sea. The Hispaniola rolled steadily, dipping her bowsprit now and then with a whiff of spray. All was drawing alow and aloft. Every one was in the bravest spirits, because we were now so near an end of the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, when all my work was over, and I was on my way to my berth, it occurred to me that I should like an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all forward, looking out for the island. The man at the helm was watching the luff of the sail, and whistling away gently to himself, and that was the only sound, excepting the swish of the sea against the bows, and around the sides of the ship. In I got bodily into the apple-barrel, and found there was scarce an apple left, but sitting down there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship, I had either fallen asleep or was on the point of doing so, when a heavy man sat down with rather a clash close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, and before I had heard a dozen words, I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there, trembling and listening, in the extreme of fear and curiosity, for from these dozen words I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended upon me alone. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 What I Heard in the Apple Barrel No, not I, said Silver. Flint was cutting. I was quite a master along of my timber leg. The same side I lost my leg, old Pew lost his daylights. It was a master surgeon, him that amputated me, out of college and all, Latin by the bucket and what not. But he was hanged like a dog, and sun-dried like the rest, at Corso Castle. That was Robert's men, that was, and comed of changing names to their ships. Royal Fortune, and so on. Now, what a ship was christened, so let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra, as brought us all safe home from Malabar, after England took the Viceroy of the Indies. So it was with the old Warus, Flint's old ship, as I've seen her muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. Ah! cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the flock, was Flint. Davis was a man, too, by all accounts, said Silver. I never sailed along of him. First with England, then with Flint, that's my story. And now here on my own account, in a manner of speaking. I laid by nine hundred safe from England, and two thousand after Flint. They ain't bad for a man before the mast. All safe in bank. Tain't earning now. It's saving, does it? You may lay to that. Where's all England's men now, I dunno? Where's Flint's? Why, most of em are bored here and glad to get the duff. Been begging before that, some of em. Old Pew as has lost his sight and might have thought shame, spends twelve hundred pounds in a year like a lord in Parliament. Where is he now? Well, he's dead now and under hatches. But for two years before that, shiver my timbers, the man was starving. He begged and he stole and he cut throats, and starved at that by the powers. "'Well, it ain't much use, after all,' said the young seaman. 
tain't much use for fools you may lay to it that nor nothing cried silver but now you look here you're young you are but you're smart as paint i see that when i set my eyes on you and i'll talk to you like a man you can imagine how i felt when i heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery he had used to myself i think if i had been able that i would have killed him through the barrel meantime he ran on little supposing he was overheard here it is about gentlemen of fortune they lives rough and they risk swinging but they eat and drink like fightin cocks and when a cruise is done why it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets now the most goes for rum and a good fling and to see again in their shirts but that's not the course i lay i puts it all away some here some there and none too much anywhere as by reason of suspicion i'm fifty mark you once back from this cruise i set up gentlemen in earnest time enough too says you ah but i've lived easy in the meantime never denied myself and nothing the heart desires and slept soft and ate dainty all my days but when at sea and how did i begin before the mast like you well said the other but all the other money's gone now ain't it you daren't show face in bristol after this why where might you suppose it was asked silver derisively at bristol in banks and places answered his companion it were said the cook it were when we weighed anchor but my old missus has it all by now and the spy-glasses sold leasts and goodwill and rigging and the old girl's off to meet me i will tell you where mate for i trust you but it'd make jealousy mong the mates and you can trust your missus asked the other gentlemen of fortune returned the cook usually trust little among themselves and right they are you may lay to it but i have a way with me i have when a mate brings a slip on his cable one as knows me i mean it won't be in the same world with old john there were some that was feared of pew and some that was feared of flint but flint his own self was feared of me feared he was and proud they was the roughest crew afloat was flint's the devil himself would have been feared to go to sea with them well now i tell you i'm not a boasting man and you seen yourself how easy i keep company but when i was quite a master lambs wasn't the word for flint's old buccaneers ah you may be sure of yourself in old john's ship well i, I tell you now replied the lad i didn't half a quarter like a job till i had this talk with you john but there's my hand on it now and a brave lad you were and smart too answered silver shaking hands so heartily that all the barrel shook and a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune i never clap my eyes on by this time i had begun to understand the meaning of their terms by a gentleman of fortune they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate and the little scene that i had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands perhaps of the last one left aboard but on this point i was soon to be relieved for silver giving a little whistle a third man strolled up and sat down by the party dick square said silver oh i know dick was square returned the voice of the coxswain israel hands he's no fool is dick he turned his quid and spat but look here he went on here's what i want to know barbecue how long are we a going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat i've had almost enough of captain smollett he's hazed me long enough by thunder i want to go into that cabin i do i want their pickles and wines and that 
"'Israel,' said Silver, "'your head ain't much account, nor never was. But you're able to hear, I reckon, lest ways your ears is big enough. Now here's what I say. You'll birth forward, and you'll live hard, and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober till I give the word. And you may lay to that, my son. Well, I don't say no, do I? growled the coxswain. What I said is, when? That's what I say. When? By the powers! cried Silver. Well, now, if you want to know, I'll tell you when. The last moment I can manage, and that's when. Here is a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett, sails the blessed ship for us. Here is this squire and doctor we a map and such. I don't know where it is, do I? No more do you, says you. Well, then, I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff and help us to get it aboard by the powers. Then we'll see. If I was sure of you all, sons of double Dutchman, I'd have Captain Smollett navigate us half way back again before I struck. Why, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think, said the lad Dick. We're all forecastle hands, you mean, snapped Silver. We can steer a course, but who's to set one? That's what all you gentlemen spit on first and last. If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with them at the island, as soon as the blunt's on board, and a pity it is. But you're never happy till you're drunk. Split my sides. I've a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. Easy, old log, John, cried Israel. Who's a crossing of you? Why, how many tall ships think ye now have I seen laid aboard, and how many brisk lads draw in the sun execution dock? cried Silver. And all for this same hurry and hurry and hurry. You hear me? I seen a thing or two at sea, I have. If you would only lay your course and a point of windward, you would ride in carriages, you would, but not you. I know you. You'll have your milk full of rum to-morrow and go hang. Everybody knowed how you was a kind of a chaplain, John, but there's others who could hand and steer as well as you, said Israel. They liked a bit of fun, they did. They wasn't so high and dry, no how, but took their fling like jolly companions, every one. So, said Silver, well, and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a beggar man. Flint was, and he died of rum at Savannah. Ah, they was a sweet crew, they was, only where are they? But— asked Dick. When we do lay them athwart, what are we going to do with them, anyhow? There is the man for me, cried the cook admiringly. That's what I call business. Well, what would you think? Put em ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way. Or cut em down like that much pork? That would have been flints or Billy Bones. Billy was the man for that, said Israel. "'Dead men don't bite,' says he. "'Well, he's dead now hisself. "'He knows the long and short on it now, "'and if ever a rough hand come to port, it was Billy.' "'Right you are,' said Silver. "'Rough and ready. "'But mark you here, I'm a easy man. "'I'm quite the gentleman, says you. "'But this time it's serious. "'Duty is duty, mates.' I give my vote. Death. When I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin a coming home unlooked for like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say, and when the time comes, why, let her rip. John, cried the coxswain, you're a man. You'll say so, Israel, when you see 
said Silver. "'Only one thing I claim. I claim Trelawney. I'll wring his calf's head off his body with these hands.' "'Dick!' he added, breaking off. "'You must jump up, like a sweet lad, and get me an apple to wet my pipe like.' You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leapt out and run for it if I had found the strength, but my limbs and heart alike misgave me. I heard Dick begin to rise, and then some one seemingly stopped him, and the voice of Hans exclaimed, "'Oh, stow that! Don't you get sucking of that bilge, John! Let's have a go of the rum!' "'Dick,' said Silver, "'I trust you. I've a gauge on the keg, mind. There's the key. You fill a pannikin and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while, and during his absence Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news, for besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of them will jine. Hence there were still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, one or another of the trio took the pannikin and drank, one, to luck, another, with a, ears to old flint. And Silver himself sang in a kind of song, ears to herself and old your luff, plenty of prizes and plenty of duff. Just then a sort of brightness fell upon me in the barrel, and looking up I found the moon had risen and was slivering the mizzen-top, and shining white on the laugh of the foresail, and almost at the same time the voice on the lookout shouted, "'Land ho!' End of chapter 11 Okay, so it didn't take Robert Louis Stevenson very long to get us to the point where we know who Long John Silver really is. Which, again, I think is one of the reasons why if you already knew, it didn't really ruin the whole book. It just meant that you got to watch how manipulative he was as he moved towards this point in the narrative. There were another couple of things that Stevenson did in this chapter that I thought were interesting. Number one, parrots probably don't live to be 200. So there's that. But they do live a long time and can easily outlive a man in a job as a pirate because his lifespan is probably going to be a little bit less than normal. So I thought that was interesting. The other thing is Israel Hands was a real dude. Israel Hands actually sailed with Blackbeard. So not the fictional Captain Flint, but the actual Blackbeard. Blackbeard was a bad guy. And Israel Hands is famous for a couple of reasons. One, because he in sitting across from Blackbeard at uh, a meal at some point. Blackbeard evidently blew out the lamp on the table, pulled out his gun, and shot Israel Hans, maiming him permanently. He was never able to work on board a ship again. He couldn't do what Long John Silver can do with his crutch and his earrings to allow him to navigate the deck. For whatever reason, Israel Hans was never able to figure out how to do that or or perform that kind of extraordinary ballet with other other tools than your legs. Instead, he wound up in, I think it was North Carolina, and shortly after he was shot, Blackbeard was killed. Once that happened, all the pirates got rounded up, and he was picked up in that particular action. And he turned and testified against the pirates. So that's one of the reasons why we have records about this guy because he's part of the court-recorded information from these pirate trials. After he left the courtroom, we really don't know very much. There's a rumor that he died as a, a beggar in London. Who knows? But either way, when Israel Hands was shot by Blackbird, at some point he, he was able to ask, why'd you do it? And Blackbeard said, uh, basically, every so often I have to shoot and or kill a man just to remind my crew who they're working for. This reminds me so much of Count Fosco in The Woman in White, 
I just, I just got chills thinking of little birds, little birds, and Fosco's wife. <laughs> so, Israel Hands, real dude, very cool. England, Edward England, was also a real pirate. I've mentioned him before. He has an interesting history, and that is not anything like Blackbeard or our fictional Captain Flint. He was Irish. He was born in Ireland in 1685. He died in 1721 in Madagascar, probably contracting some nasty tropical disease. But one of the things that made him different was that he had a reputation for being compassionate and kind and really a pretty good leader. He was more educated than one might expect. He seems to have had a, a lovely upbringing. He had a chance at one point to turn and live as a free, legal person. He and his, his crew actually had this whole opportunity because the Royal Navy was trying to convince people not to be pirates. And so they were going to use England and his guys as spokesmen, basically, for this program. And uh, it didn't take him very long before he said, yeah, you know what, now that I'm free, nah, I don't really want to do that. And so they, they got another ship and they went a pirating until he got into an altercation. His guys and this other pirate's guys got into an altercation over an island. It was bad. It was like 10 days of fighting. It was miserable. Finally, England and the other guy came to a truce agreement. But England's guys weren't quite so happy with the whole truce thing and marooned him with several of his other men who, because he was really very good and smart, he and his other men found a way to build a ship and sailed off kind of skirting around all of the dangerous places. And that's how he wound up eventually on Madagascar. Right? Wild. These pirates had, the, the ones who lived long enough, had interesting itineraries that they followed. <laughs> so, so what have we learned? We have learned that Long John Silver not only intends to mutiny, but mutiny wisely, so as to make sure you get the treasure. He, we also know that he really wants to kill Trelawney. We have also learned, though I didn't talk about it before, that Trelawney actually turned out to be pretty useful. After Mr. Arrow went bottoms up overboard, Trelawney took some watches. He, he knew enough to know what he was watching for, and he was able to pitch in and do some work, which, honestly, surprised me. But it doesn't change the fact that Long John Silver really wants to kill Trelawney. But he's also saying he's going to kill Jim, or some of his people are going to kill Jim, because they're going to kill all of them who aren't part of the pirate crew because dead men tell no tales. So that's a little unnerving if you're hiding in an apple barrel, and this is what you hear. But my favorite moment... <laughs> was when Jim hears Long John telling Dick that he's smart as paint. And you can just hear Jim inside his head saying, but wait, I'm the one who's supposed to be smart as paint. <laughs> it's easy to laugh at, but it's, I mean, he's what, 12 or 13? So I get it. That That's the way to get him to recognize that Long John is really up to no good. Now he's, he's an interesting character though, because the other advice that he's giving you know, save your money, be prudent, be smart. Look how I did it. I'm going to retire like a gentleman. It's all going to be awesome because I was careful with my money. That's all great. And then it's how he's going to get that last chunk of money to ensure his good life that makes you start to go, maybe not such a good guy. And of course, we've also learned that there are at least some members of the crew who are not going to turn pirate, which gives Jim at least a little bit of good news to transmit. But largely, we have the gut-turning moment where it looks like someone's going to come find Jim in the apple barrel. But then everything is fine. Jim is allowed to hide. We don't know how he's going to get out of the apple barrel, but we know that he needs to get to Dr. Livesey and Smollett and Trelawney to let them know what's really going on. And that is where we'll pick up next week. All right, you take care. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.
If you like what you heard, please leave us a review at iTunes or like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or any one of a million different places that Craftlet wound up over the last 13 years. For more information on Craftlet, you can visit craftlit.com and subscribe via your favorite podcast app or download the Craftlet app so you can get all of your episodes right there in your hand, all in one place without having to hassle with anything else. So you can be sure not to miss any of Treasure Island. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Thanks. Thanks.